Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today is Thursday, September 10th, 2020. In today's podcast, preeclampsia, it's a big deal. Sherry Gelber and I discussed the topic of preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a relatively common complication of pregnancy that can range from a very minor issue to a life-threatening situation. We discuss what it is, how it is diagnosed, and how it's managed in pregnancy. There's so much we do not know about preeclampsia, which is one of the reasons this is a complicated topic. But Sherry and I try to present what we do know and what we have yet to learn. Next week, Emily Oster returns to talk about something other than corona, the do's and don'ts of pregnancy. Before I turn it over to the podcast, I want to just say one mention about tomorrow, which is, of course, September 11th, a very important date in the calendar for me personally, for New Yorkers in particular, and all Americans. I have such vivid memories of the enormity of the despair at that time. I was a first-year OB resident, and my wife and I were living in New York City with our one-year-old twins. It was profoundly terrifying and a sad time in our history. But I also remember the unity we all felt, the admiration and respect we all had for our first responders as they were the ones running into the towers as everyone else was trying to run out. And the sense that all of us were just in this together. I can't think of a better message for us today. Times have been difficult for different reasons, of course. One of the things that helps me at least are the memories of the weeks after September 11th. We figured out a way to get through that difficult time together, and I'm truly hopeful we can all once again come together to get through our current challenges. Thanks a lot, have a great day, and have a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Helpful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, Sherry Gelber, welcome back to Helpful Woman. It's great to have you. Great to see you again in person during the pandemic. Thanks for having me. How's everything going with you, your life? Everything is terrific, other than the <laughs> pandemic. Uh, other, other than COVID, things are awesome. I asked Sherry to join the podcast today to talk about preeclampsia. It's a really fascinating topic. And I know that you've been very interested in this as well from all levels, basic science, clinically. And it's also something that's relatively common in pregnancy, at least the spectrum of preeclampsia. And I don't think people realize that. Yeah, it's super common. And the way you know that disease is common is when it's portrayed in TV. (laughs) Because you know the people who made the TV shows are doing this because they had a friend or a sister or someone who had it. And they were like, oh, that would be an interesting storyline. So now that we're we're on television, which which show or series are you talking about that's been on TV? Anything in particular? On ER, which was a big thing when I was a medical student, but I feel like ER has been off the air for a long time. But then it was a big storyline in Downton Abbey, which has also become dated. Right. Best thing about the Downton Abbey episode was that there was a general OBGYN fighting with a specialist about whether the patient had preeclampsia or not. And who was right? The general OBGYN, the person who knew the patient the best. That's fantastic. And so just so our our listeners understand, many of them may know what we're talking about, but for those who might not, how would you explain what preeclampsia is? So there are a lot of ways to look at it from the most basic way a patient thinks about it or that a doctor thinks about it is it's a condition that for the most part is diagnosed by having high blood pressure and protein in the urine during pregnancy. Every patient doesn't present that way, but that's the most typical presentation. Right. And the interesting thing is it is a condition only of pregnancy, meaning men don't get it. Women who are not pregnant don't get it, with the one exception is you can get it after you deliver. So you're not currently pregnant, but it's related to pregnancy. And so it's, and the reason is because it comes basically from the placenta or a reaction to the placenta. Exactly. So we think that you get set up for preeclampsia super early in your pregnancy. At the end of the first trimester, something happens with the placenta where it doesn't implant in exactly the way that we'd like. And that sets you up to have this problem later. And sometimes the later is around the time of viability at 24 or 26 weeks. But mostly it happens around term, like after 37 weeks. 
And I think everyone always thinks that they're coming in every week at the end of pregnancy. So the doctor will tell them when they're going to go into labor. But all of those end of pregnancy visits, like one of the main things we do in prenatal care is screen people for preeclampsia. Right. right. That's why you get your blood pressure checked every visit. And that's why we have women pee in a cup every visit is to check for protein mostly in the urine. And I think what you said is so important that we have a lot of understanding of what happens to women when they get preeclampsia. Like we understand who gets what symptoms and we can tell you what percentages and how severe and there's blood tests and all these things we can tell. And we sort of understand what's going on in their body, but we really have a very poor understanding of why someone gets it versus someone else. We know risk factors, but why would a placenta implant poorly or why wouldn't it? And we don't really understand that quite yet. And the other thing that's so interesting is like you said, it's a disease or a condition that manifests typically at the end of pregnancy, but it's been brewing almost from the very beginning. And sometimes you can know about that and frequently you can't know about that. And so it is a really, from a scientific standpoint, fascinating as a condition. From a clinical standpoint, it makes it very challenging because it happens and we don't really know how to disconnect point A and point B. Maybe we know someone's at risk we'll talk about some strategies, but there aren't great ways to sort of say, oh, you're at risk. We're going to do this and you won't get preeclampsia. That's right. We don't have a good predictive model. So there are things that are on the horizon. I would like to think in five years, there might be some kind of test that would identify groups of high risk people. And we don't have a treatment. Even if we knew who was going to get preeclampsia, we, if we knew a hundred percent at 12 weeks that someone was going to get preeclampsia at 24 or 28 or 37 weeks. We don't really have a treatment to prevent that from happening. Right. Which is very hard. And and why is it that we care so much about preeclampsia? Like what's, what's the problem with it? What happens or could happen? So it's problematic for both the mother and the baby. I'd said earlier that you get hypertension and protein in your urine. And with hypertension, it's not that blood pressure drifts up a little bit and maybe you've always been at 90 over 60 and now you're 100 over you know, 70. It's that often a patient who has very low blood pressure or normal blood pressure going into their pregnancy and in the first half of their pregnancy will suddenly have elevated blood pressure. And we consider elevated blood pressure to be 140 over one over 90, but sometimes people can get much higher blood pressure. So they can get a systolic blood pressure of 160 or 180 or 200. And at numbers like that, especially in a patient who has low blood pressure, the mother can actually have a stroke. Right. And so it's interesting because if you, it's, it's one of the ways in which it's different from what we call essential hypertension or sort of run of the mill, high blood pressure People have high blood pressure, usually their blood pressure is you know, slightly or moderately elevated. And the reason it's a problem is because if they have it for many years, it'll damage their blood vessels and they'll get you know injuries to various organs and this and that. And so it is a, a disease you don't want to have and it's treatable. But preeclampsia, it's only happening in that form for days, weeks, or months. So it's not a long-term issue in that regard. But since it goes up so high so quickly the blood vessels have not been able to adapt to that increased pressure and they can have a stroke, sometimes a seizure. I mean, it could be really dangerous for the mother. And so it's something we have to be very much on top of. Those things are unlikely to happen if the blood pressure is just a little bit high, but those people are at risk for the blood pressure then going up much higher. So we have to either treat it or deliver them, deliver the baby or, you know, whatever it is we have to do to, to get them from getting to that point with a much higher blood pressure. And how would it be dangerous to the baby, which is what you mentioned before? The most basic thing is that anything that's dangerous to the mother is always dangerous to the baby. Right. So if the, like, sometimes we think a patient needs to be delivered and she's like, no, no, keep me pregnant. And, you know, I always say, if something bad happens to you, something bad will happen to your baby. Right. So that's one thing. But also because preeclampsia is a disorder of the placenta, the placenta is what provides nutrients to the baby. And when the placenta can't do its job, it can cause decreased blood flow to the baby. So the baby may not grow appropriately. There's an increased risk for stillbirth. Right. And sometimes the placenta could even start shearing off something we call placental abruption which can happen in this. And yes, when, when there is quote unquote a bad or a damaged placenta, 
it can lead to problems with the baby, obviously, and problems with the mother. So some of it is the preeclampsia can cause a problem with the baby. And some of it is that if the mom is getting worse preeclampsia, it also means the baby's placenta is getting worse and the baby's at the same time going to have problems related to that. And so like you said, it is dangerous for both of them. And how common is it sort of in general in a typical population? What's a woman's you know, risk at baseline? So we say the rate in the general population is between 5 and 8%, but there are high-risk groups and there are low-risk groups. Right. So who would be at increased risk of getting preeclampsia? We say people at extremes of age. So that generally means people younger than 19 or over, some people would say 35, some people would say over 40. Right. It goes up as you get older. So where you draw the line in the sand is somewhat relevant, but it's as you get older, the risk goes up as well. So for someone who hasn't had a baby before, that's a risk factor. So if you've been pregnant before and you haven't had preeclampsia, you're at decreased risk. Right. But if you've had preeclampsia before, you're at increased risk. Right. And then also women who undergo IVF in vitro, there's an increased risk. Some of that is overlap because on average, they tend to be a little bit older, but even younger women who undergo IVF, there's an increased risk. And interestingly, having a donor egg yes. increases the risk of preeclampsia, which is also sort of a fascinating idea that one of the possible reasons of getting preeclampsia is this immune phenomenon. So how would you explain that to somebody? In general, when you are pre when a woman is pregnant with her own egg and a partner's sperm, half of the genetic material is foreign to the woman, and your body will sometimes identify foreign things and make an immunologic reaction to it. And we don't really understand how that works in preeclampsia. Right. Why it happens in someone with preeclampsia, but doesn't happen in everyone else. The, both what protects us and what caused that to happen is something we, there's a lot of research about it, but we don't have it fully understood. But certainly when, you know, we, you mentioned the donor egg, when people have a no preeclampsia with one partner, but then their next pregnancy is with a different partner, right. there's a thought process. Some people think that that will put you back to your baseline risk. So it doesn't make you as low risk as you'd be if you had the, a pregnancy with the same partner. Right. And then when you have a donor egg, 100% of the genetic right. material is not hers. And so there that's the theory of why there's an increased risk of preeclampsia in women who undergo donor egg. Other risk factors, the higher a woman's body mass index or obesity is an increased risk. If she has a history of other conditions related to either blood pressure like having high blood pressure baseline or kidney disease like lupus. Diabetes. Increase, yeah, diabetes increase the risk. And then also having a twin pregnancy puts you at increased risk for pretty much everything. And preeclampsia is on that list as well. Yeah. Twice as much placenta, twice yeah. as much trouble. And then as you said, there are some other things we can use in pregnancy to find that a woman's at increased risk. There are blood tests that results will indicate there's an increased risk versus decreased risk. There are some ultrasound findings. But as you said, they're not perfect, meaning you can't use them and say you will or you won't get it. It just sort of your risk has gone up a little bit. Your risk has gone down a little bit. And they're they're okay. But as you said, one of the reasons they're not done routinely is because they cost a lot of money. And what are you going to do about that? There's really no difference in prenatal care necessarily. We do this, and many women have this first trimester screen for aneuploidy, this nuchal translucency ultrasound, and it comes with blood work. And one of the pieces of the blood work is something called the PAP-A, which is the pregnancy associated plasma protein A. And when that's low, there's a risk, it's a risk factor for developing preeclampsia. Right. So when a patient is high risk for preeclampsia and their PAP-A comes back normal, I feel better. <laughs> When they're high risk and it comes back low, I feel worse. But I always tell patients with a low pap A, it's something we want to watch closely. Like we want to follow the baby's growth, follow them more closely for signs of preeclampsia. But most of those patients won't get preeclampsia. And I think the concern about doing blood tests that have poor predictive value is that you really scare patients when most of them will be okay. Right. And also the other thing about preeclampsia is the endpoint is so different for each woman. And so if I were to tell someone, you know, you have a hundred percent risk of getting preeclampsia, but 
that story is going to be at your due date, you're in labor. And while you're in labor, your blood pressure goes up, you deliver the baby, and then the blood pressure goes down and you're fine the rest of your life. You should be like, well, okay, like that's not such a big deal. But if I say you have 100% chance of getting preeclampsia, and it's going to mean at 28 weeks, your blood pressure is skyrocketing, you're admitted to the hospital for two weeks, you have to get delivered early, the baby's in the you know intensive care unit for two months, and you're on blood pressure medicine for two months, that's a much different story, but it's the same disease. Right. So, you know, we worry the most about patients who get preeclampsia before 34 weeks. Right. But that's only 10% of the patients who get preeclampsia. Right. So most patients get preeclampsia after 34 weeks where it's a bump in the road of their pregnancy, but it's not likely to have any kind of long-term adverse outcome for them or their baby. It's right. that 10% that happens before 34 weeks where we're really worried about the well-being of the mother, the well-being of the baby. And that's, you know, it's it's part of the reason we tell people on the one hand, it's something we take very seriously. Preeclampsia is a big deal, but it's really because we're looking for those few people who it's going to be really serious for them and the baby. Even the people who get preeclampsia, the vast majority of them, they're fine. Their baby's fine as long as someone knows what they're doing and takes care of them and recognizes the symptoms and the signs and knows what to do, everyone's going to be fine. But there is that small percentage that you need to know about because it could be life and death in those in those circumstances. Also, because most preeclampsia happens after 34 weeks, like, yeah, most of the time you'll get away with it. Right. But when someone is diagnosed with preeclampsia, it almost always gets worse. And yes, so it's progressive. The way that bad things happen is everyone's like, well, it's not so bad. I'll wait. I'll see what happens. The patient doesn't want to be induced. The doctor doesn't want to induce the patient. And you can get in sort of a tizzy about giving someone a baby that's a little bit preterm. But if it plays out where it progresses, it could be really really dangerous to the mother. Right. I totally agree. I always tell women preeclampsia is going to get worse until you deliver. And it still may get worse after you deliver, but then it'll start to get better. We don't know how quickly and how severe. So we sort of do our best to figure out, you know, exactly when is the best time to deliver. And we'll talk about that sort of how we think about it. That's different for every person. But, you know, and also part of it is like you said, the diagnosis for most women their blood pressure is going to be elevated. But there are other parts of the diagnosis, right? The classic diagnosis is high blood pressure, high protein in the urine. But there's also symptoms like headaches, which are very scary because we think maybe it's a precursor to something like a stroke or a seizure or changes in vision, you know, unusual spots and blurry vision are also things like, you know, chest pain and pain in the belly. Obviously, vaginal bleeding would be concerning. And then there's blood test abnormalities, you know, their liver enzymes can be elevated. There's a lot of things that can happen and everyone has some combination of those. And based on what that combination is, it helps us classify sort of how we definitely put into two groups, mild and severe, although it's a spectrum. There is very mild to more severe to very severe. And we use all of those parameters and how high our blood pressure is to decide how bad is this. And that's important because it helps us determine how to treat it. What is the only actual treatment that works for preeclampsia to get rid of it? Delivery of the baby. Right. And the placenta. Yes. <laughs> they come together. But it's, and that's another thing that we, we stress women. There is nothing that we do that cures preeclampsia other than delivery. So we can sometimes hold off some of the symptoms or some of the signs, meaning we can control blood pressure for a certain amount of time. There are medications, mostly magnesium, we use to prevent seizures for a certain amount of time. You know, so we can sort of maybe get things stable, but it is going to get worse until we deliver. And so for a woman who has preeclampsia, for her, delivery is going to be the right thing for her health unless we're certain or nearly certain that she's stable and the baby's going to benefit from staying inside, in which case we'll try to wait. And in what circumstances would we try to wait, meaning that we wouldn't deliver right away? For people who are preterm before 37 weeks, if the mom is stable, if her blood pressure isn't 
too high, so it's not more than 160 over 110. If there are no lab abnormalities, if she's not having symptoms like headaches, it's often okay to wait until 37 weeks. When you're prior to 34 weeks, usually the, patient, the woman has to stay in the hospital if she has any of those severe things. So blood pressure over 160 over 110, lab abnormalities, things like that would concern us. But when patients are less than 34 weeks, we try to wait, but we need to make sure that it's safe for the mother. The way I try to talk about it with patients in this circumstance, and all of us sort of think of it this way, but it's sometimes hard to you know, convey the feeling is that at any moment in pregnancy, we're sort of always evaluating the sort of risk to keeping her pregnant versus the risk to delivery. And the risk of keeping a woman pregnant with preeclampsia is to her health and potentially to the baby as well. And the risk of delivery, if it's preterm, is potentially to the baby. So we're always in a situation, the earlier the pregnancy, it's a higher risk to the baby to be delivered because the baby's going to be very premature. And the sicker the mother is, the higher the risk of keeping her pregnant. So using those two variables, we sort of have to figure out at any given point, what's the overall best thing to do? Generally, at the end of pregnancy, it's easy because there's really very little risk to the baby to being born, you know, 36, 37, 38, 39 weeks. And so we deliver. And the earlier you get, sort of the bar is set a little bit higher for when we're going to deliver. But since we're in a situation that's at risk for the mother during that waiting period, we watch them by them, I mean her and the baby, very closely, sometimes in the hospital, sometimes daily office visits, sometimes twice a week. Again, based on what's going on, we do frequent blood tests. We test the baby. like We check her blood pressure all the time. There's a lot of things we need to do because we need to be sure it's not worsening to make sure we can still wait as much time as possible to maybe let the baby develop more. Sometimes we give something called steroids to help the baby's lungs mature quickly and try to stabilize the mother. But those are tough situations when someone's very preterm and very sick. Yes. That was a nod from Dr. Yeah, Gelbert. I'm not so good at the radio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Podcasts. <laughs> podcasts. That was the podcast nod. Any silence uh, is definitely the podcast nod. And then in terms of medications, just to review those. So magnesium is something we give to women who are potentially at risk for having a seizure. It's given intravenously. It, it's sort of an odd thing because we don't really give it for any other reasons in medicine or very few reasons to give intravenous magnesium, right? Right. Yeah, And you don't usually give it for seizures either. No, it's not a treatment for seizures, but for whatever reason, magnesium prevents eclamptic seizures, right. does not prevent other kinds of seizures. And the medications we use for seizure disorders right. don't work nearly as well for preeclampsia. Right. And again, that's what, what Sherry was saying is eclampsia. So the word preeclampsia is the condition before eclampsia, which is that condition with seizures. So anyone who's preeclamptic is, we think of them as someone who could seize. And so the problem with the magnesium, even though it works so well, is there tends to be a lot of side effects. So it's not something you can give someone a pill and have them go home on it the rest of pregnancy because it doesn't work as a pill. It has to be given intravenously. And there are side effects. So it's something that they have to stay in the hospital to get. And it's usually given in a temporary uh, situation, either at the very beginning, because we're not sure how it's going to go, or sometimes during or after delivery, because these symptoms and these risks can persist for a little bit of time after the baby's born. Right. So magnesium, the experience of being on magnesium is usually pretty miserable for yeah. patients. It, people don't feel good on magnesium, but it would be a very unusual situation where someone had to be on magnesium for more than 48 hours. Right. So it's usually a day or two. And then the medications we use for blood pressure, sometimes they're intravenous, sometimes they're given as pills. And again, those are really just temporizing to keep the blood pressure under a number where she's at risk for having a stroke. But generally, if someone's getting a lot of medication, we're preparing for delivery, either immediately or within a few days. It's only the patient who needs a small amount of medicine and it works and she can stay stable for several weeks that she's going to be on it for a long time. Typically, it's a short amount of time until after she delivers and then maybe yes, maybe no, based on what's going on. Right. One of the problems with preeclampsia is people have what we call labile blood pressures. So it's not that the blood pressure goes up and it stays up, because if that was the case, we could give the medication and bring it down. It's that they have erratic blood pressure. It'll right. be very low and then very high. So we can treat the highs, 
But then if you make the blood pressure, if you start someone on medication and you make it too low, that can also be problematic for the baby. We're cutting off blood flow to the baby right. if the mom's blood pressure is too low. Right. So when mom's blood pressure is a little bit higher, that like water pressure pushes blood towards the placenta, towards the baby, and the baby's sort of used to that. And so if we lower her blood pressure too much, it can reduce that and the baby sort of, you know, quote unquote, gets upset that it's not getting the same amount of blood flow nutrients. And so that could be an issue. So we really only give medicine to keep mom safe under that bar of very high blood pressure just to keep it mildly elevated. But again, it's not the solution to the problem. It's just temporizing. It's just something we do in the interim. Ultimately, like we we're saying, there has to be a decision at some point, when are we going to deliver? And when that decision is made, is preeclampsia a reason why a woman would have to have a cesarean delivery? No. Right. Some people think that, that, oh, I need to have a cesarean because I preeclampsia. But in fact, you can induce labor and you know, usually it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but that's true for anybody. Right. If the baby is super small or the placenta is super bad, mm -hmm. their baby might not tolerate being in labor. And so oftentimes when a patient is at the, the end of pregnancy and we're worried about preeclampsia and they're like, no, no, I don't want to be induced. You know, I'm worried I'm going to have a C-section. I often think to myself, if we deliver you now, you might have a better chance of having a vaginal delivery because your placenta is that much younger and right. the baby might do better in labor. Whereas if we wait until everything is really bad, it might be hard for the baby to get all of the things it needs during labor. Right. And that's a really good point because there was this idea that inducing labor increases the risk of C-section from you know, it not being natural and the process is sort of happening artificially. And so therefore it's more likely to quote unquote fail, end up with the C-section. And that idea persisted in medical books and in teachings and in everything we read for pretty much forever. And then there've been several studies and there was actually specifically one for women who had high blood pressure like this gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and where they showed that if you induce women, they don't have an increased risk of C-section compared to waiting and they're less likely to get sick because you're delivering them earlier. And like you said, I agree in situations where sometimes we think it's better to wait and maybe better to do the opposite because a placenta is a little bit healthier now than it's going to be in a week. Because the other reason you end up with a C-section and labor, other than the labor sort of not progressing, is that the baby's heart rate keeps dropping. And if that's going to happen less frequently, maybe you can avoid it for that reason. So that's a really good point. Yeah. And also, you know, we talked about risk factors for preeclampsia, but one of the things we didn't talk about mm -hmm. was a post-due date pregnancy. Right. One of the reasons people may get preeclampsia is because the placenta has gotten old. So it's right. not that the placenta was bad from the start. It's that the placenta has given up. Right. Like, I've taken care of this baby for 40 weeks. <laughs> I'm done. And I'm done. <laughs> I'm out. It's someone else's problem now. And that's probably a different mechanism of action. It's right. probably the placenta has outgrown its blood supply. It's getting less oxygen. Right. And so it's secreting things into the mom's blood that make blood pressure go up. One of the interesting things I want to talk about is the use of aspirin or low-dose aspirin specifically. Uh, the difference is in aspirin. If you pick up an aspirin, it'll be 325 milligrams. And then there's something called baby aspirin or low-dose aspirin. We don't actually give it to babies anymore, but it kept the name. And that in this country, at least, is 81 milligrams pretty much everywhere. In Europe and other places, you can get 100 or 150 milligrams, but in the US, it's 81. And there have been a bunch of studies showing that if women take baby aspirin starting early in pregnancy when that placenta is implanting and developing, it does have a small benefit in terms of reducing the risk of preeclampsia. It doesn't eliminate the risk. It just lowers it by about a relative 10%, which is good. I mean, and because the baby aspirin is pretty much harmless otherwise. There are a lot of studies showing that baby aspirin is safe. I don't think we hesitate to prescribe it to people. And I think overall that 10% decrease is right, but the people who it helps the most are the people who are at highest risk. Right. So the data is the people who are going to get preeclampsia early, the people who have a lot of risk factors are more likely to benefit. Right. The people, you know, sometimes we give it to people who aren't at such high risk. And when you're not at such high risk, we might be able to lower their risk a little, but we might not be able to lower their risk as much. We do recommend it for women with 
certain risk factors, and there's you know different ways to figure that out. But basically, women who are at increased risk of preeclampsia will generally recommend baby aspirin starting somewhere, you know, 10, 12, 14 weeks in that range, unless there's a reason she shouldn't take it. There are some women who either have an allergy or some sort of reason they can't take aspirin for any, you know, in any uh, dose, but most women can. And it's, like you said, all the studies have shown that it's safe both for the baby and for the mother. And so that's something that potentially, if given to many, many, many women, could reduce the risk of bad complications in that group to some degree. So that's that's a hopeful, it's not really a treatment as much as a prophylaxis, preventative medicine. Right. And a lot of times patients will say to me, oh, I saw some kind of doctor, maybe a gastroenterologist right. or something, and you know they told me not to take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Right. And I know I'm not supposed to take aspirin. But oftentimes when we speak to those doctors and we say, well, we just want to give the patient a low dose of aspirin, just 81 milligrams. Most people, regardless of the medical, the patient's medical conditions, most people can take low dose aspirin. Yeah. So I wouldn't just take it if you've been told not to take it, but it's worth having that discussion. And the other thing is sometimes you'll find on aspirin bottles, like do not take if you're pregnant or ask your doctor if you're pregnant, which is sort of a standard thing they put on all bottles of medicine. But people will say to me, are you sure it's safe? It says on this bottle to ask my doctor. I'm like, yeah, like, um, you asked me, it's safe. And so people sometimes get afraid that that means that it's known to be dangerous. That's a standard thing they put on pretty much any bottle that has medicine in it to ask your doctor if you're pregnant. But baby aspirin is well known to be safe in pregnant women, both for the baby and for the mother. One of the other fascinating aspects about preeclampsia is we were talking about that the only cure, so to speak, is delivery, having the baby, the placenta removed from the mother. But number one, the disease or the manifestations of the disease can linger in her for sometimes it's several hours, sometimes it's several days, sometimes it's several weeks, and sometimes months, meaning some women, they deliver and then their blood pressure is literally like four hours later, blood pressure is normal, everything is good, they're perfectly fine. And other women are dealing with this for two months. And it's hard for us to know why it's that way in one person and not another, which is itself fascinating. Number two, some women actually have nothing and present with high blood pressure for the first time a week after they deliver, which is also so crazy that they're perfectly fine. And then suddenly a week after they deliver, their blood pressure goes up. And we don't understand why that happens, but it definitely does. What, do we have any like explanation for these things? Or it's just sort of like, whatever. I could make up a bunch of reasons. <laughs> you know, there are these hormones that are secreted from the placenta. Maybe there's a little bit of placenta left behind. Sometimes right. that happens and patients could come back with bleeding. Right. But also some of these anti-angiogenic factors, they might get stuck to blood vessels. Right. And then later they come off and right. that can cause an increase in blood pressure. Right. There's so many reasons that's important. Number one, just because it's interesting, like an RN. Number two, because we have to tell women that we don't know what it's going to be like after you deliver. Like we know you're going to get better. We just don't know when. And it's hard to know exactly. So that's something just to sort of prep people for the possibility. Like I tell women, you may be on a blood pressure medicine for two months. That's unusual, but it happens for sure. And the other thing which is so important is when women go home after having a baby and they had preeclampsia, even if they got better in the hospital, we always, always, always recommend they check their blood pressure frequently, whether that's once a day, every other day, come back to our office in three days. It sort of depends on the circumstances because it could come back. And if it's treated, she'll be fine. But if it's not treated, it could again be very dangerous for her. Again, the baby's born, so it wouldn't affect the baby, but it could affect her health significantly. Right. And any patient, even if they didn't have preeclampsia, if they go home from the hospital and suddenly they have a headache, yeah. they have visual changes, it's not something to blow off. It's right. really something that a woman needs to call her doctor about. Yeah. And so that's something that we're always on the lookout for. And we, when we, talk to women before they go home, we discuss some of these symptoms that you should be on the lookout for. Again, it's unusual, but it does happen periodically. And when it does happen and someone it's noticed and we see them and the blood pressure is elevated and we treat it like we know that that was a good thing that we found out about it because really bad things could happen otherwise. And the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is also a, a newer area of research and understanding is this idea that women who get preeclampsia have an increased risk in their lifetime of getting high blood pressure or potentially even 
heart disease. And is that something that you think happens just because there's overlapping risk factors? Or is it something that the preeclampsia does to her and like changes her blood vessels? What are your thoughts about that? So there's data for both things. I mean, there's actually data that the experience of preeclampsia does change your blood vessels in ways that put you at risk later. Right. But there's also this idea that there are patients who are at increased risk to have chronic hypertension, to have cardiovascular disease, to have kidney disease. Right. And that what preeclampsia is doing is unmasking those risk right. factors. Right. So your the experience of preeclampsia is then a risk factor that right. you should tell your primary medical doctor about. Right. So either way, in, in the second case, it's that the preeclampsia is sort of, you know, turning on a light saying, hey, you are a person since you got preeclampsia, you are a person who is also at risk for these conditions, like warning, you should know this for later in life. And it could be 30, 40 years later. It doesn't have to be three months later. Or number two, the preeclampsia did something to me, right? Maybe affected my heart, maybe affected my blood vessels that puts me at increased risk. But either way, it's one of these things that we always, and we talk about a lot more now for women who have certain complications of pregnancy, notably high blood pressure, diabetes, things of that nature, you know, sometimes even some liver conditions of pregnancy, we always tell them, this is a part of your medical history. You know, don't, pregnancy should not be in this box that's sort of sequestered from the rest of your doctors. Even if they don't take care of pregnant women routinely, you know, they should know, hey, when I was pregnant, I had diabetes and I needed insulin. Or hey, when I was pregnant, I had crazy high blood pressure. I stayed in the hospital for three weeks. And a good doctor will know that that means something and they need to possibly screen you differently over the course of your lifetime than they would otherwise. And so always remember to include what happened in your pregnancy, in your medical history when you meet with other doctors. I mean, the dermatologist might not care so much about it, but certainly medical doctors, primary care doctors, cardiologists, endocrinologists, people, that's surgeons, they they need to know these things. Right. I always tell, like for so many women, their gynecologist is their only doctor. Like, right. Why do you need another doctor? But once a patient has preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, anything like that, I'm like, now you need a primary medical doctor. Your gynecologist can't be your only healthcare provider. Right. And I think all this is so important because like we said, preeclampsia is a relatively common condition, you know, five to eight percent is a lot. Many women have babies, and if you know one out of 15, one out of 20 of them is having this complication, it's important. There are risk factors for it in pregnancy. It's like the main thing we look for. The, it, the two things we look for in the whole pregnancy, like every time, is is the baby growing and you have preeclampsia. Like that's the main thing that we're checking almost every visit, and so we're really focused on it. And when it occurs, or if it occurs, it can be straightforward, or it can be very complex and requires a lot of complicated decision-making by the doctor, by the woman herself, you know, in conjunction, like trying to figure out what the right thing to do is, but then it doesn't end. It really persists as a part of her life story. And that's important for her medical health moving forward. That was another nod, right? Yes. (laughs) Many patients think, you know, something like that happens and they're scared, but I view it as an opportunity. Right. This is the thing. If something happens later, we're going to catch it early. We're going to treat it. We're going to make sure that there's not some delay in diagnosis that would put your health at risk. Later. Right, right, right. And also sometimes, you know, for many women who got this, you know, there's really nothing they need to do about it. If they're in good health and they eat well and they exercise and, you know, their weight is good and they don't smoke and, you know, they see a doctor periodically. It's just, all right, just add it to the list of my medical history. But for some women, it's like, you know, wait a second, you know, I had a baby. I'm in my, I'm in my forties. I'm a little bit overweight. Maybe I haven't seen a doctor in a long time. And it's sort of like, wait a second, this is like, maybe I should start getting on top of these things, which does provide an opportunity for lifelong health. And that is, like you said, sort of looking at it from the positive side of all of these events that can occur during pregnancy. Well, and I also always tell patients that when they're done being pregnant, they should try and lose their baby weight. Right. Because for so many women, they gain an appropriate amount of weight in pregnancy, and then they maybe lose 80% of it. Right. And then they get pregnant again. And, right. you know, it's the same thing. And now three children down the road, they weigh 30 pounds more than when they started. Right. And that's not 
good for them. So preeclampsia and no preeclampsia, it's important that once you've had that baby, you need to take care of the baby, but you also need to take care of yourself and right. your own health. Right. And it's a challenge. I mean, it's it's hard. It's something that if it's not going well and it's not happening the way you want it to, that is something you should bring up to your doctor. I mean, this is something that we care about also, and we want to help. And everyone on earth knows it's hard to lose weight. It's not a secret to the medical community either, but there are ways sometimes that we can help and have advice and you know, also just to be supportive and say, yeah, we know it's hard and it's important. And, you know, just to be encouraging that everyone's on the same page with this. Right. And I think for so many years, everyone was like, eat less, exercise more. But now there are a lot of people who are doing innovative things. So if it's something you're having trouble with, I would ask for help. Well, this is a really great overview of preeclampsia. I mean, there's so many angles to this condition and it is unfortunately prevalent, but Again, it's one of the things that if people are on top of both you, the patient, us, the doctors, if you're in the hospital, potentially the nurses, everyone's going to be okay. It's really something where it gets bad when it gets ignored or signs are missed. And so this isn't intended to scare people, obviously, but it is something that's very important and it is a big deal. Yes. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on, Cher. I appreciate it. Always good to talk to you about these topics and I'm certain we will have you back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.